Well, welcome to the School of Photography, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Gatt, for those who don't know. And today is, uh, again, the School of Photography Anniversary Week seminars. And today is F-stops. So for today's topic, we will be talking about what is an F-stop. We will talk about depth of field. We'll talk about the sweet spot, the hyperfocal distance of a lens. We'll talk about zone focusing and We'll open up to questions and then what's next. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to answer or to ask anytime, either on the chat or on the microphone. So what's an F-stop? Well, a lot of time people don't quite realize that it is actually an answer to a mathematical question. And it measures the volume of light that is coming through your lens that is going to strike your digital sensor, or for those who are still shooting film, strike your film. So you don't need to memorize, but just have a general idea to what this equation is. And it's very simple, actually. It's just a focal length divided by the glass opening of your lens. And when I say that, I mean, it's the diameter of the glass, not the filter thread, not the diameter of the filter, but the actual glass front opening. And the answer is your maximum aperture. So for example, if you have a 100 millimeter focal length lens and the front glass opening is only 25 millimeters, well, 25 divided into 100 is four, or you can say it's one quarter of 100. Therefore, one quarter of the existing available light that is coming through the lens is actually going to make it to the back of the lens to strike your sensor or film. Now, when digital, excuse me, when photography started in the 1700s, shutter speeds were very, very long. So if you said to someone you had an opening or use a setting of one quarter or one eighth, they knew you were talking about aperture because time of shutter speeds were in the minutes and in some cases even into the hours. So it wasn't until we got newer film that film speed became shorter and then there became a bit of confusion between time and aperture opening. So to distinguish the difference between a quarter of a second and quarter of an opening, they then changed the phrase, the focal opening or the focal fraction, and they changed it with an, the one with an F. So F4 is literally a fraction, which is one quarter. So one quarter of the available light is making it through that lens. Now this formula is going to show you what the maximum aperture opening is on a prime lens. So in other words, not a zoom. There is a more complicated uh, calculation for a zoom lens. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, some people find this a little bit much. So we're gonna keep it very simple and light for today, but there is a more complex formula to calculate the maximum opening on a zoom. Sorry, Peter, we're not actually seeing your, your slides changing. Okay, that's what I was worried about. Okay, I, I'm still getting this error. Let me just see if I can figure out why. Okay. Let me try this. All right, can you see the slide now? Yep. So you can read an f-stop is the answer to me. You can see all that? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so anybody want me to repeat what I just went through or are we okay with that so far? I'm okay. Okay, I got some questions popping up here. I'm not seeing a slide. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, perfect. So sorry about that. I was you aware of that. Okay. So the math behind it all. So this is a formula that I basically put together. Um, the actual formula, and I'm sure it's more sexier, more complex than this, but this is in a nutshell what is going on. So the opening the f-stop equals the diameter divided by the focal length. So if your focal length um, it's 100 and the diameter is 50, 
we just bring it down to the lowest common denominator. So 50 goes into 50 once, 50 goes into 100 twice. So it's one over two or half. And we replace the one with the F and it's F2. If the diameter 25 focal length is 100, bring it down to the lowest common denominator, one over four or F4. Here, if it's uh, 36 millimeter is the measurement of the diameter over 100 mil, it goes 36 goes into 36 once, 36 goes into 100, 2.7777, and it keeps on going, times. So basically, it's F2.8. And this is, in a nutshell, what is happening when we're talking about our aperture. It is a fraction, and it's an actual measurement of volume of light that's making it through the lens to strike your sensor. So with a 50 mil, if my diameter is 28 millimeter, 28 goes to 28 once, 28 goes into 50, 1.7857, and it keeps on going times. So we say one uh, F1.8. And it's the same 50 millimeter, but it is bigger, 37 millimeter, and it comes at 1.4. So far, so good. So there's more to it than just that, obviously. So on this one here, you can see the top illustration shows an icon F, a 50 mil F1.4. Now, not only at the front glass here on the right-hand side, not only is this bigger than the bottom F1.8, but even the rear element is larger than the 1.8. So it's not just the front glass that's going on there that is much bigger. Every part of it, so all of the opening, all the internal glass, the rear element, everything is larger on an F1.4 compared to a 1.8. Now, keeping in mind, the difference between F1.4 and F1.8 is one third of a stop. It's not a significant change, although the price point is more significant, but it's only a third of a stop between an F1.4 and a 1.8. Now, when the manufacturers are making lenses like the F1.4, it does require a bit more attention, bigger glass, better polished glass, and generally speaking, nine times out of 10, the 51.4 lens is sharper than a 51.8 lens generally speaking. So that's why people like the 1.4, not just because it is that one third brighter, it is also noticeably sharper than a 1.8. All right, so now we're gonna put this math thing to the test. Now, my measurement is not necessarily the greatest, but I tried my best. This is an old measuring tape that I had. So from this part of the glass to this part, it's roughly 28, not quite, but almost 28 millimeters. Again, they're gonna have better precision ways of measuring it than I'm doing with the tape measure, but you get the idea. It's about 28 millimeters. So when we do the math on the 50 millimeter, it is a 1.8, roughly, okay? And then when I do the same thing with a 51.4, now the measurement from this point to this point, again, that's the glass. The filter thread is 52, but from here to here, it's now 37 millimeters from the edge of the glass to the edge of the glass. And then when you do the math, it's 1.4. And again, the rear element is much larger. Okay, my lens are dusty, I gotta get them cleaned again. But it's much larger on the 51.4 than on the 51.8. Make sense so far? Okay. Therefore, since the aperture, F dot, are always measured in fractions, F2.8 is a large or big opening or aperture or number, whichever way you look at it. I know a lot of people try to tiptoe around how to say if it's a big opening or a small opening or whatever, and it's always the same. It really doesn't matter. There's no need to tiptoe. It's a fraction. One over 2.8 is a big fraction. 
compared to F16, F22, 1 16th, 1 over 22. So everything about it is large. The large number, the large aperture, it's a large opening. Everything about it is large, other than depth of field, which we'll get into later on. F22 is little or small opening, aperture, or number. So one way to remember it or to think about it is think about it like a piece of pie. A quarter of a pie is bigger than an eighth of a pie, which is bigger than a sixteenth of a pie. Or an F4 of a pie, F8 of a pie, or F16 of a pie, or F16 of a pie. Because we don't say the TH, F16, people tend to lose track or forget or never been aware that these are actually fractions, but they are. So why has this seems all of a sudden people having difficulties understanding that they're fractions and understanding that F2.8 is big and F22 is small? Well, believe it or not, this all started happening 15 to 20 years ago, right around the internet and more specifically eBay. How is that? Well, if someone wanted to send, sell a lens, for example, I wanted to sell my 50 F 1.4 lens on eBay, you can't put the forward slash in the title. When you put the forward slash, that becomes part of the, the URL, the URL of the webpage. And it doesn't allow you to put the forward slash because they think there's a different part of the folder or part of the website. So you're not allowed to put it. So when people read on the eBay, the lens, there's never a forward slash. So people tend to lose track that it is, in fact, a fraction. We don't see the visual slash. So just keep that in mind. All of these numbers are fractions. Shutter speed is a fraction. Aperture is a fraction. Everything's a fraction. Now, when we start getting into it, when we start dealing with the different apertures, every time we change from one whole aperture to the next, we double divide in half. So from aperture F5.6, we open up to F4, we're going to larger. So open, bigger, larger, whatever you want to call it. We go up to F4, we let in twice the volume of light. From F8, we stop it down, F11, we let in half the amount of light to come in. Now with your DSLRs, when you change your aperture, you don't actually see a change. The change only occurs the moment you take the picture or for those of you with depth of field preview, which is a little button often seen underneath the lens in the front part of the body. When you depress and hold the depth of field preview, you will then see it go to the working position. Otherwise, the aperture doesn't change until the moment you take the shot. Any question on that? So I mentioned depth of field. So what is depth of field? Depth of field is the area of acceptable sharpness in front and behind a point of focus. So not only does the aperture control, well, the aperture controls the volume of light, but it does influence what we call depth of field. So when we focus on a subject, how much in front and behind is in focus is what we call depth of field. So if it's a little bit, we call that shallow depth of field. And if it's a lot, then we call that great depth of field. Now depth of field follows the one third, two third split. A lot of time people think because it's half in front or part in front, part in behind, it's 50, 50, but actually it isn't. One third forward, two thirds back. That doesn't matter if you're doing a portrait, macro or landscape. It always follows that rule just due to the nature of optics. Now, this is an old lens, probably older than most of us here. This lens is from 1940s. And back then, things were done properly. 
These lenses are all color coded. F4 is green. So here we have, now it's supposed to be green, doesn't really look green, but this used to be green. And this is the green marker. So that tells me if I choose F4 from this marker to this marker, the two green markers, that's my depth of field. F8 from red to red, that is my depth of field. Same with the 11, F, uh, F11 is the orange to orange and F16 is from blue to blue. Now I know what you're saying. You're thinking to yourself, well, these look the same distance in front and behind. It looks equal, it looks 50-50. Well, yeah, they are. But we're not looking at the markers. We're looking at the physical measurements in front and behind the subject. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. So here, when we're dealing with depth of field, this was a common mistake a lot of people make, especially with landscape photography. We always focus on the background. I wanted to get everything in focus, and I focus on the background. Well, no, you don't want to do that. You want to focus on the foreground. Why? Well, depth of field. Now, when you focus on the subject, so in this case here, infinity, that's the symbol for infinity, if you focus on infinity, at F4, I have a little bit in front, let's call that 16 feet, to infinity. All of this is going to be in focus, all of this area. Now, if I change the aperture to F8, so now I have 15 feet to infinity. So I gained a foot. I lost two stops, four times the volume of flight, but I gained a foot of acceptable sharpness. Now let's go all the way F16. So now here, that's roughly nine feet to infinity. All of that is gonna be in focus. But wait, look at all of this depth of field behind infinity. This is not being utilized. It's all being wasted. What's behind infinity? More infinity, right? So this is not being, used at all. We're wasting all of this potential. So in the old days, the expression was you take the infinity symbol and you place it on the outer marker. In this case, F16, that'd be the blue marker. So now instead of focusing at infinity, we're actually focusing at about eight feet. And instead of getting nine feet to infinity, I have almost four feet to infinity. I just gained four, excuse me, five feet of foreground depth of field, all because I chose to focus on the foreground, particularly in this case, eight feet. Now, I said before that depth of field is one third forward, two thirds back. Well, we can see it right here. So we're focusing at eight feet. I'm gonna call this four feet, it's almost four. And this is a little bit past 15, so I'm gonna call it 16 feet just to make my math easier. So from four to 16, that is a total of 12 feet of measurable depth of field before in infinity kicks in. Now the distance from eight feet to four feet is four and four is one third of 12. And the distance from eight to 16 is eight and eight is two thirds of 12. And there you have it, one third forward, two thirds back. Every single shot with every single lens will follow this rule. So that's why it's important when you are doing any photograph where you place your focusing, even on a portrait. So on a portrait, we typically tell people, focus on the eyes. People sometimes ask why, and there are some great stories. Sometimes they'll say, Focus on the eyes because the eyes are the soul to the person. That's not why we do it. Sometimes they say the eyes are the most important part. Mm, not always true. So what is important is the tip of the nose to the back of the ear. If we want the tip of the nose to the back of the ear, from the point of my eyes, my nose is one third forward, my ear is a two third back. This is why we focus on the eyes. Now, if you're photographing a dog, not a pug, but like a Doberman or something, they tell you, don't focus on the eyes. You focus halfway between the eyes and the nose. And then we do it. It works. You don't question it. It works. But why does it work? 
the one third, two third rule. Okay. Now these are the newer modern lens. This is a 35 autofocus F2 D lens, and it does have this scale. And you can see F22 put the infinity. It's just shy of uh, four feet. Is uh, sorry, five feet is the focusing point, and I'm not really good with metrics. So 0 0.7. I don't know if that's a foot and a half, something like that. 0 0.7 meters. That's about a foot and a half. Um, so that is around the range you're going to have from about a foot and a half to infinity with a 35 millimeter lens. Any questions? Now that's only if you shoot at f22. Right now this lens is f11, so you have f11 from one foot to two foot, you're gonna have a one foot range. Or one meter to two meters, sorry. That's one meter to two meter. All right, so here I'm doing a portrait. Now, I don't know how well you can see on your screen. Hopefully you have a fairly big screen. So I'm focusing on, this is my colleague, Rebecca's eyes. And you can see her eyes are in focus. Her nose, the tip of her nose is actually not in focus, but it's not bad. But you can see her earrings are not in focus. And that's at F2.8. When I change it to F4, the tip of the nose is almost in focus. Her left, our right ear is almost in focus. Her right, our left is still not in focus. At 5.6, her nose is in focus, her ear is in focus. This one is slightly soft. And that's because her head is slightly tilted, but it's pretty good. And this is why we typically say for a portrait, we shoot at F5.6, because now I have the eyes and nose and the ear in focus. F8, I definitely have both ears in focus. The collar is starting to become sharper. The shoulder is still blurred. The background is still blurred. And we're starting to recognize more obvious shapes in the background. F11, her shoulder is now in focus. And that's it for Rebecca. She is not going to get really any sharper, at least no more depth of field. It's just primarily the background that's going to be impacted now. So F16, that's seeing the snow a little bit sharper. F22, over here in the background, we notice this car. And if you look really closely, you realize it is a Beck taxi cab. And at F32, this lens went to F32, I actually can make out the handle on the door of the car. And I don't know, that is at least 100 feet away. Keeping in mind, this is where we started. Everybody okay with that, any questions? Okay. So I'm gonna do the same thing here now, but with Rebecca, I didn't have much coming forward because it was just the tip of her nose. So now I'm gonna get these uh, dominoes and get down to the table and same thing. So at F2.8, I have just the one domino in focus. F4, you can see the front and the back slowly improving. 5.6, again, slowly improving. F8, F11, F16, F22, and then again, F32. So they're all the same distance apart. Now, the front, the first and third are almost, well, the first is not quite in focus yet. The third one is, and the, uh, the fourth one is still blurry. So you can see it's not quite coming forward enough, but it did go back enough to get the second one or the third one rather, and then not quite enough for the fourth one. So you can see it's slowly coming forward, more going back. All right, now, apertures do not control depth of field. That's a very big misconception a lot of people have. As I mentioned earlier, aperture influence depth of field. There are three things that control depth of field, three things together. So aperture is one, focal length is the other one. So if you have two camera, two lenses, 
both five feet apart from the subject, one with a, for a full frame, a normal lens, 50 millimeter, you're gonna have less depth of field than with the full frame 28 millimeter. 28 millimeter inherently has greater depth of field than a 50 millimeter. So this is part of the factor to whether or not you have a lot or shallow depth of field. And the other factor, of course, is your physical distance. If you have two lenses, both 100 millimeter, both 5.6, if you are five feet away from your subject, you will have less in focus than if you have the camera at 25 feet away from the subject. So these three things, what we known as the, the triangle of the depth of field, these three things control how much or how little depth of field you will have in your photograph. So here I am five feet away. I'm using a crop sensor camera and this particular photograph, 24 millimeter F5.6. Now we all think of F5.6 as being shallow depth of field, but here I have a lots of depth of field. I have my daughter in focus, the park bench, the um, trees are not sharp, but definitely recognizable. And it's at 5.6. So the big influence here is the fact that I am using a very wide angle lens, it's a 24 millimeter lens. Now on this particular lens, this is my Nikon 12 to 24 millimeter F4 lens. And the maximum distance before infinity is in fact five feet. So to this lens, I'm pretty much shooting at infinity. So that's why I have so much in focus in front and behind her. Sorry, Peter. Um, so does that mean if you're further back, you, you won't get much more in sharp focus? At 5.6, that is correct. Okay. Now, as you go down to F8, F11, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. We start getting into what we know as the sweet spot of the lens. So once you start getting to the middle portion of the aperture, the middle portion of the lens, those part of the lens are sharper than the biggest opening or smallest opening. So F5.6 on this lens is not a sweet spot. So if I went to F8, F11, that would be the sweet spot and that would be sharper, but otherwise, Moving back will not give you any more depth. Just going down a stop or two would give you a bit more sharpness and that's it. So here, still five feet away, still F5.6, but with a hundred millimeter lens. So now you can see it's a tighter shot. The monkey bars in the background are absolutely blurred. And this is with my 80 to 200 2.8 lens. So I changed the zoom so it's at the 100 marker and very, very shallow up the field. So telephoto has less in focus than wide angle. So same distance, same aperture, just different focal length. So I did the same thing again the following year. 100 millimeter, five feet away, 5.6. And the background is blurred. So if I back up to 25 feet, okay, the background is not sharp, but it's more defined. We can see more information. You can see that it's a brick wall. There's some trees, there's snow there. It's more obvious what things are compared to five feet away. Now, if you look closely, there's my daughter standing. The pavement here, this section is really the depth of field. So it is very shallow. But because I'm so far back, I'm almost at infinity. Everything else is not as blurred, or sometimes people use the term bokeh, not so blurred, so diffused, so out of focus as being further back towards infinity. So the closer you get to the subject, the blurrier the background shall be. Everybody care of that so far? We're good? So again, this is the um, depth of field triangle. So on the top left here, the focal length 15 or any wide angle lens, 
will provide better or greater depth of field. Telephoto 200, 300, 400 will provide shallower depth of field. If they all have the exact same aperture setting, they're all gonna provide different results. So 15 will give you more, 200 will give you less. Aperture, again, typically 2.8, big aperture, shallow depth of field, while F22, smaller, greater depth of field. And then distance is a little bit of exaggeration here, but one centimeter away, uh, very shallow depth of field, 10 kilometers away, you're gonna have a huge depth of field. Now, hopefully you don't focus something 10 kilometers away, uh, a bit redundant, um, but you get the idea. All right, so I keep saying the sweet spot, the sweet spot, so what the sweet spot? So as I said before, aperture, influence, depth of field, what is depth of field? Terminology is everything. Depth of field is the acceptable sharpness in front of behind the point of focus, not the absolute sharpness, acceptable. We want the sharp, we want the absolute. So with the sweet spot, this is the sharpest part of the lens. So we have two general rules that we follow. One is called three up, three down. Another two up and two down. So the way it works is zoom lenses, I'm sure you all heard this before, zoom lenses are not as sharp as prime lenses or non-zooms. So to get the sweet spot, the sharpest part of the lens, you take the biggest aperture, you stop down three stops, or you go with the smallest aperture and you open up three stops. And anything that falls in between, those are called the sweet spot. Those are the sharpest part of that particular lens. Now with a prime lens, because it is sharper, it's gonna be two up and two down. So from the biggest aperture, we stop down two stops, or from the smallest aperture, we open up two stops. And again, anything in between, those are your sweet spots. Now, the only exception to the rule are the pro zoom lenses. So if you have like a 70 to 200 2.8, they are often referred to as a prime zoom with a bit of an oxymoron because prime means it doesn't zoom and the zoom means it does zoom. So what they're saying is this zoom is so good the sharpness is almost the same as a prime or non-zoom. It isn't, it really is not. Prime lenses are still sharper, but for the amount of money, for the reduction of weight, it is worth it. So three up and three down. So if this is my scale. If I have a 2.8 lens, that's my biggest aperture, F2.8 and F22 is my smallest. So with a zoom, if it's a regular zoom, if I go down one, two, three stops, that's F8. If I go from the smallest, go up one, two, three stops. Okay, in this case, I only have the one aperture, so it would be F8. And that would be the sweet spot. Now, if it is a prime or a prime zoom, and it's a 2.8 lens, we go up and down by two. So I go one, two stops down, that's F5.6. And then go up one, two, that's F11. And F8 is in between, so therefore it's included. So now I have three apertures that are the sweet spot for this particular lens. Okay. But one of the things I hear a lot why do people spend so much money on an F 2.8 lens and they seldom ever shoot an F 2.8? They always shoot a 5.6. That's why we shoot portrait, a 5.6, that's a sweet spot. You could shoot at 2.8, you'll have less depth of field, but it's also not the sharpest part of the lens. So if you had an 80 to 200, which was a 3.5, 5.6 lens, and you zoom to 200, 5.6 is no longer your sweet spot on that lens. You have to go down two stops. So it'll be F11. But with an F2.8 constant, if you zoom to from 80 to 200, zoom to 200, the biggest aperture is still 2.8. So when you go down one, two stop, 5.6 is still the sweet spot. And that's why professionals do buy those 70, 200, 2.8 lenses because 
it helps us keep the sweet spot at a good shallow depth of field. So on this lens, this is a prime, this is not a zoom. So from F16, go down one, two stops, F8. From 2.8, go up one, two stops, 5.6. Sorry, I went down, sorry. From 2.8, go down, from F16, go up. So eight and 5.6 are both your sweet spot. Now this is a macro, and the macro has typically a broader range of apertures to choose from. So the biggest is 2.8, the smallest is 32. So from the biggest F2.8, I stop down one, two stop, I have 5.6. From the smallest, open up one, two stop, F16. F11 and F8 are also part of the sweet spot. So all four of these apertures are the best part of this lens. Make sense? Yep. So um, can I ask about, so if you have a one, say if you have a 1.4. Yes. That, that's 1.4 is not a whole stop, right? No. Nope. So do you just go to the, you, you just go to the, to the full stop? Actually, 1.4 would be a full stop. Sorry. 1.4 would be a full stop. Okay. 1.8 is not. Okay. So if you have a 1.8. Yeah. 1.8 is not a full stop. Right, so where would you base your your two up or three up from? On the if you, lens, if you did it from one point eight, then you'd be at a. If you went three, if you went, uh, how do I want to say this? Like, if you're going three up and it's three full stops from one point eight, is going to be what? Well, if you go three full stops from 1.8, you're going to have unusual numbers. Right. right. So the full stops, I probably should write these down. So the full stop goes as such. F1 is a full stop. 1.4 is a full stop. Then it's F2, 2.8. F4, 5.6. 8, 11, and so on. So you'll notice every other number doubles. So we start with one, and then we start with 1.4. So from one, it doubles to two. And then 1.4 doubles to 2.8. And we take the two, we double it to four. That's the next one. And then the 2.8, we go to 5.6, right? So the every alternating number keep doubling the two previous. And that's how the options go. So if you had 1.8, it's not two, and it's not 1.4, so it's, it's a half stop. And well, it's about a third stop. But so now you just take it as a two. Okay. So from 1.8, so forget two, then you go to the next one. Uh, F, uh, not five, um, 2.8. So from, from 1.8, then go 2.8, then four. Yeah. Because otherwise you'd be doing, you know, 2.6 and it, it just gets too much. So just stick with the main aperture value, the whole numbers, and don't worry about the third stop. So if your aperture is a third stop, just go with the closest next whole aperture. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Back in the day, unfortunately, they are no longer. But popular photography had great magazine and they had a great website and they love doing lens tests. So the lens test was a resolution test to see how sharp the lenses were. And they would rate them in this graph. Now this is a very unusual graph because I've always thought and presumed green was good, green was go and red is stop. But here red is the best. So it's kind of backwards for me. So here, what they do is they shoot the resolution chart and they photograph it at every aperture, the whole aperture. And then they print at various size and then they rate each of those settings and they give it a value. So you can see this is a 50 millimeter uh, Pentax F1.4 lens. And I have to admit, this is actually one of the sharpest 
lenses Pentax ever made. So the chart is really, really good, but you get the idea of what is going on. So at 5.7, shooting a flat subject at f1.4, all the way down to f22, it got great marks. Now, if you look at the marks, 96.9, the middle to all 97, and the outer two go back to 96. I can't tell that's 96 or 95, um, but it gets lower. Then at 8 by 10, again, 96 in the outer two, and then the middle is a little bit better, F8, the best one at 97, and then goes back down 96 and 95. Then 11 by 14, you see that the outer two, the 1.4 and the two, fell to the A, which is still very good, but it's not as sharp, tack sharp, as the center sweet spots. And the outer two, F16, 22, again, they fall into the A category. Now, this one here, there's a slight little blip, but it's not a big deal. So at 16 by 20, 1.4 fell to a B plus. Two is still rated as an A, and so are all the middle ones. And then the smallest two, 16 and 22, again, they got a lower grade of B plus. And then we go to 20 by 24, back to what we expect. The outer two graded as a B, which is still not bad. And then the middle is a B plus and then B for the outer. So you can see the center is always the sharpest. And that is what we refer to as a sweet spot. Everybody care with that? Hyperfocal distance. Has anyone heard of that before? I know, Jay, you have. We talked about this before. Yeah. Anybody else heard of that, or is this all brand new term? Let me just write quickly in the chat. Let me know. Okay, we have Mike never heard of it. They got a couple of people new. Okay. It's actually a very, very old term, but um, it's one of the things that got lost over time. And um, it was a really big different uh, deal, big deal back in the day. And that's another term that uh, we'll get into a little bit later on that is kind of replacing it, but this is what it's all, all about. So the hyperfocal distance at the simplest is just a focusing distance that helps you to maximize your depth of field, or at least know exactly what will be in focus on your shot. So it's really good for landscape, architectural photography. So if you wanna make sure you have the foreground and background, everything in focus, we wanna know exactly where to focus. So that when we focus on that spot, we know up until this point, let's say four feet for argument six, from four feet to infinity, everything's going to be in focus. And if that works for my shot, shoot. If that's too much, I don't have anything on four feet. So now I can change my focusing a little bit further back and then go to, instead of F22, I'll go to F11. And then I get what I need in focus. I don't have to shoot at the smallest aperture every single time to get the most amount of depth of field. If my image doesn't have things in the immediate foreground, then I can go back to my sweet spot, it could be F11, F16, to get maximum sharpness. And that's a mistake a lot of people make, is when they're doing landscape or architectural photography, they immediately go to F22, thinking that the most amount of depth of field I'm going to get, which is true that it's the most, but it's not the sharpest. People confuse depth of field with sharpness. So as we talked about in the sweet spot, F22 is not part of the sweet spot. We can go down two stops from there. So we want to ideally aim for a landscape shot at F11. So knowing where to focus to maximize your depth of field to get the best sharpness on foreground and background, that is the ultimate goal. So your hyperfocal distance lens uh, will vary on your lens according to the aperture. So as we change the aperture, we're gonna change how much, how little depth of field you have. And therefore, if you want to get max, usually that means including your infinity, then your hyperfocal distance position is gonna change accordingly. 
So as I was saying before, if you don't need foreground of three, four feet, then I don't have to put my focusing at five feet. I can probably put it at six feet or seven feet so that I have what I need from five feet to infinity instead of three feet to infinity, if that makes sense. So as we change our aperture, we are going to change, we're going to effectively move where the hypofocal distance will be. So in a nutshell, what we're looking at, this blue dot represents the beginning of the depth of field right down to infinity. Now, infinity probably kicks in here, actually, but it keeps going on forever. So where we focus, we have one third back, two thirds forward, and then we hit infinity and it goes on forever. So this is the depth of field, but where I focus, it's a hypofocal distance. So when I was showing you that lens earlier, I said, when we focus on the foreground eight feet, we got four feet to infinity. Well, eight feet technically is the hypofocal distance on F16 on that individual lens. So this is a little bit more accurate. We have our focusing point, and that is the hypofocal distance. And depth of field is going to be one third forward, two thirds back, including infinity. And then it keeps going on forever. So, so what do you, if you can go back to the previous slide, there's nothing there to focus on. So what do you, what do you focus on? Or do you? That's a great question. So there are two options. There's nothing as far as real subject to focus on, but we do have a ground. So we can use the ground, but regardless, you have to determine what the distance is going to be. So this is why it is really important to know where infinity begins on your specific lens. And then what is the macro or the closest focusing on your lens? Now, most cameras, or excuse me, most lenses will tell you the closest. If you have a, uh, a kit lens, it tells you the closest focusing. Use it the symbol on the side of the flower, and it tells you 0 0.8 feet, whatever, to infinity. But we don't know where infinity actually begins. So with the better lenses, the higher-end lenses, like the one I've been showing you, they all have a scale, and that scale shows you where the macro is and where the infinity is. So if you don't have that, you have to figure out where infinity begins. And unfortunately, the instruction manual will not tell you. The website does not tell you. What you'll have to do is pick a subject, focus on it, and you're going to see and hear the lens move to focus on that subject you're focusing on. Take a step back. It will look blurry in the viewfinder. Depress the shutter halfway. It's going to refocus. Take a step back and keep doing that until there's no change. It doesn't focus. That means you're at infinity. Take a step forward to where you last were and measure the distance from there to your subject. And that is the maximum range of focusing before infinity kicks in. Now, once we know that either written on the lens or we just did the test, now we have a range. Okay, so if my infinity kicks in at 10 feet, well, I know I'm not focusing past 10 feet. So it gets as close as two feet, all right? So now I'm gonna figure from six feet to two, uh, two feet to 10 feet, where am I gonna focus? Well, I might wanna focus at four feet. So from four feet, I have one third coming forward to get to the two foot range, two thirds going back to include the 10 foot range infinity, and that maximizes my depth of field. So now I can either find something in front of me, auto focus four feet in front of me, or I can manually focus at the five foot range or wherever you determined is the ideal focusing spot. So here, yeah, there's nothing there, but we have to determine where we want it to be. You have gotta know where infinity begins and you have to know where your macro begins to figure out what is the ideal point to focus. And yeah, you have to do it manually sometimes but that's how you get it. Did that help? Yep. 
<clears throat> yep, thank you. So like I was saying, the older lenses used to have this all calculated right in and it was so much easier. And with the newer lens, uh, they don't all have that, especially the kit lenses, the less expensive lenses don't have that. So you have to do the test yourself to figure out where your um, infinity begins and where the macro begins. And then once you figure out, like I said, if, if the macro is two feet, and I have my camera on a tripod and I'm four and a half feet high on the camera. And the closest thing in my photograph is six feet away from me. Well, I don't need great depth of field coming to two feet. If my first subject in the ground is six feet away from me, then all I need is six feet to infinity. So now I don't have to bring my focusing so close, like five feet. I can push it out maybe seven feet and still have the one third, two thirds at F22 give me what I need in focus. But maybe at F22 at seven feet away, I'm getting too much. I'm going past infinity. Again, it's a bit of a waste. So now I can bring the aperture, open it up a bit instead of F22. 22 go to f16 get closer to my sweet spot or even f11 which would be ideal so this allows you to play and really focus on no pun intended on what setting you want and need and where to place your focusing so often people just i hate to say this but people just point and shoot now we are calculating and making a conscious decision where we want to place our focusing, whether it's autofocus or manual focus, and we're putting it to a specific distance to give us what we want in focus. Everybody okay with that? And by the way, uh, FHD is hyperfocal distance. So this is the old lens, my old 24 mil, and placing on infinity, Focusing is roughly three feet. It might be 3.1, but let's just call it three feet. So here it's about a foot and a half to infinity. So a foot and a half to infinity at F22, it's going to be maximum depth of field. So the hyperfocal distance is three feet. And I have all of this in focus. Now, again, as I said, if I don't have anything in my viewfinder, that is a foot and a half then I don't need F22. I can maybe change my focusing to four feet. That'll bring my minimum to two feet. And then I can get away with F16 because the infinity would be here as well. So F16, I now have two feet to infinity with my 24 millimeter F2.8 lens. So now I'm getting closer to my sweet spot I'm still getting great depth of field, two feet to infinity. That's a lot. That's an amazing amount of depth of field. Uh, what if I don't have anything on my subject at two feet? All right. Then I bring my focusing maybe over to five feet and then go to F11. And that way I have three feet to infinity, which is still an enormous amount of depth of field. And I'm in my sweet spot. Make sense? Does that work better now? Now, I like math, but I don't like this math. This math is not very good. So there are lots of charts, lots of apps to help you with calculating your hyperfocal distance. Before you go on your phone and start looking for hyperfocal distance apps, don't download them. They're no good. I haven't found one that works yet. And I'm going to show you why that is. So this one here, I'm going to start with the top. So this is hyperfocal point in feet from the shooter. So this is where you're going to focus. This is a hyperfocal distance to help you maximize or control how much you're going to have in focus at the various apertures. Now, if you're shooting at 2.8, you're not really concerned about hyperfocal distance, but um, with the 15 millimeter you are to focus 13.8 feet away. 
15 millimeter. That's a fisheye. Anybody have a fisheye? No? I have a fisheye. My fisheye does not focus past two feet. So how does that work? How do I focus at 13 feet when my lens only goes physically to two feet? I don't get that. Now here at F30, I don't have F36 on that lens, but I do have an F32. So it's 1.68 feet. I did put it at one foot and I did shoot. That's what I do. Now the lens I just showed you here, this is a 24 millimeter F2.8 lens. So 24 millimeter at F22, it says the hyperfocal distance is 4.29 feet. Well, this is Nikon and it says three feet. Yeah, I'm gonna believe Nikon. Now here, whoop, wrong button, sorry. Here, it says, there we go. Uh, 24 millimeter, it says at F8, 11.81 feet away. So that's where I'm going to focus, almost 12 feet away. Wrong button again. Again, we know this lens does not focus 12 feet away. This might be five feet. This could be six feet. That's at the max. Well, we know two meters is six feet, right? So maybe past six feet, maybe eight feet. So that's beyond, we don't have 12 feet on this lens to focus. So these charts don't work. Now, I'm assuming a lot of you have, if not all of you have a telephoto. So a hundred millimeter, I think is a very common lens. I think we all have a hundred millimeter either as a prime or as a zoom. And at F22, I, I, I can't focus at 74 feet away. My hundred mil only focuses up to 12 feet. How much put the focus at 74 feet? 584 feet, that just doesn't make sense. This chart does not make sense at all. It really doesn't make sense. So here's another chart. I'm gonna stick with F24, uh, 24 millimeter, sorry, because that's the lens that I just showed you. And at F22, it said three feet and this said 2.9. Okay, that's pretty close, that's good, I like that. F16, that, that's four, okay, that makes sense. As we start coming down to the aperture at F5.6, we know that lens doesn't focus past 12 feet. So what 22 and 15 feet, that doesn't make sense anymore. Now, keeping in mind, the hyperfocal distance really is for wider angle lenses and for smaller apertures, F11, 16, and 22. This is what we're really concerned about. Now we go to, now this one here, the smart, the only one as far as 85 mil, because there's really no point after that. But still, even on an 85 millimeter F16, they're at 49 feet away. My lens doesn't focus that far away. And here at 280 feet, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So don't worry about the chart. Same thing with this is the app. And this is cool in concept. It tells you what the actual range is but it tells you this, this, the subject is 52 centimeters away. So this actually, this part here works, the near and the far and where we focus, this actually works. This one here doesn't. So the hyperfocal distance here is 22 inches away on a 33 millimeter lens. That's almost two feet. So I think this one might not be too bad. Uh, F8. Uh, so let's be very careful with these ones. This app actually might actually be all right. Sorry, this is 22 feet, not 22 inches, what am I saying? It's five and a quarter inch. So 22 feet away on a 33 mil, which is similar to 24, it's not gonna focus past 12, 12 feet, let alone 22 feet at F8. So again, these ones don't do the best of jobs. And this one here, again, this is the closest one that works. So 24 millimeter, now there are two different settings. This is APC, uh, APSC, the APS compact, and this is the full frame. So the full frame, F22, 2.9, almost three feet, that's good. F16, four feet, again, this is all very good. And all of these make sense. When we get back to telephoto, it no longer makes sense. So again, you're not gonna really use this hyperfocal distance for telephoto, it doesn't make sense. We're really concerned about the wide angle. So if you're going to use this for a wide angle portion, this is actually pretty good. And this is digital camera world, where I got this one from. So the wide angle is actually quite good. So 16 millimeter, um, half a foot to 3.8 feet. 
uh, 3.8 feet doesn't really make sense, but everything else is doable, but it, it works otherwise. So again, this is the hyperfocal distance, three feet on this individual lens. Every lens is different. Okay, so this one here is, I don't know, four and three quarter feet. Different focal length, different hyperfocal distance. Okay, I don't know what the focal is in this one. This will look like a 35. This one here has a different focusing range. So this one can focus much greater than most wide angle lenses can. And it's a Leica. So five points, oh, sorry, F8. This is uh, four and three quarter feet up to nearly 12 feet. And that's your depth of field range and F8. And the hyperfocal distance is kind of like six and a half, six and three quarter feet, almost seven feet. Okay, so again, just like I showed before, when you put on the blue, put the outer infinity on the blue to the blue, and that is your range, half a meter to two meters or almost one and a half feet to six feet and then infinity at F16. And that's gonna give you closest to your sweet spot of F11. Before we move on, any questions on that? Because that is a loaded one. Does everybody understand the concept of the hypofocal distance? Hey, Peter, um, take care. Uh, just trying to figure out uh, the, the mech okay, or the smallest uh, f stop for a lens, for normal, like normal. Lens. How do you know that? I know normally they said uh, f5. With, and to whatever, is that what you're talking about? R repeat that, I didn't quite follow the question there. So I'm trying to find, like uh, on what you've been showing so far is that about, uh, yeah, like that, that actually, those lenses shows that it has two, uh, F2 to F2, 22. Yes. Right? But then for the lenses that, like right now I have uh, uh, Sigma 150, 600, the okay. only f stop I see is five to five six point three. It's five to six point three. Yes. Or three point five to six point three. No five. Five to six point three. Okay. 6 .3. So what that tells you is, I'm sorry. What was the focal length again? One hundred to six hundred. Yes. Okay. So what that tells you one fifty okay. to six hundred. So what that tells you is when you zoom to one fifty, your biggest aperture is f five. As you start zooming out 200, 400 to 600, you slowly start losing light. So now at the 600 millimeter position, your biggest aperture is, what was it, 6.3? Yes, 6.3. 6.3, okay. So that's called a variable. We call that a variable zoom. So as you zoom, the maximum aperture varies, it changes. In a nutshell, you're losing light. Now, in theory, I'd have to take your lens and show it to you, or, or you can just do it yourself. Just scroll, go to aperture mode, just turn the dial until you get to the smallest possible aperture. Now, because the lens varies, it's going to vary on the smallest end of the scale as well. Now, typically, when you are at the 150 millimeter position, the biggest is F5, the smallest would probably be F22. It is very possible it could be F32. Now, as you zoom out to 600 millimeter, the smallest is going to continue to get smaller because you're losing light. Physically, it's the same position, but because the, light, uh, the lens barrel has extended, you have the light traveling further. And as light travel through the lens, it loses its intensity. That's why you're losing light. So on the 600 millimeter, you could get F45 or even F64. That is possible. So what is the smallest? I don't know. I don't know that lens very well, um, but I could look it up for you. But the simplest thing to do 
is put the lens on the camera, go to aperture mode, zoom to the 150 millimeter position, and keep turning your dial. What, what camera do you have? A Nikon or Canon? Oh, Nike, uh, Canon. The Canon. So you're going to be turning uh, the back wheel. Keep turning that wheel until you get to, oh, actually, if you're in aperture mode, it'd be the top dial. Top dial, and then see what the smallest number is. And yeah. it should, should be okay. probably F22. Then zoom. I would zoom halfway to 300. Keep turning. It's going to go down. Because if you just zoom, it's not going to change on its own. You have to keep scrolling. And then it's going to get smaller. And then go all the way to 600. Keep scrolling some more. It's going to go down. Now, if you're at F, I don't know what it is, F45, F64, whatever the smallest is. And then you go from 600 and you zoom back to 150. It will automatically change back to F22, whatever the smallest was originally on the 150 millimeter focal length. So as you zoom out, it will continue to change. But the first time you get there, it's not going to change when you zoom. Okay. You okay. So, so the, the camera do automatically um, figure it out then? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's what I was trying to figure uh, to, to figure out itself. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so with the new digital camera, the all electronic, it, it showed you everything. And with that note, if you are using a teleconverter, the camera figures out the new aperture. You don't have to worry, I'm losing two stops. Keep that in the back of your mind, you're losing two stops. But the camera will calculate the new aperture on the zoom, on the prime, it doesn't matter. You put on an extension tube, teleconverter, anything like that, zooming back and forth, the camera will know all the adjustment to make automatically. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, so who's heard of zone focusing? You can type in the chat, let me know if you heard of zone focusing. I don't think I know this one. No? Okay. Um, okay. This is a very common practice that people use. And I'm going to be really nice and easy on you guys. It's the same thing, a type of focal distance. It's the same thing. It's just a different name. So we see this a lot where people are going to focus on an area and they need a certain area to be in focus or the zone and sometimes you can't actually focus a great example that i use here is photojournalists and we see this a lot where especially when there's a, a scrim or when there's a um like um, someone coming out of the courthouse whatever you see a big pile of journalists trying to get the photograph or the news anchor trying to get in for a question and there, there's all this climbing on top of each other and everyone's trying to get the photograph. So sometimes they'll throw the camera up in the air and they'll take a picture. How do they know what they're getting in focus? How do they know where the camera auto focusing is aiming? Well, the answer is they don't. So they use what they call zone focusing. And basically it's not basically, it is absolutely the same thing at the hypofocal distance. So they figure out how close are they going to get so if the person in question, whether it's a celebrity or a suspect coming out of the courthouse, whatever, is not going to get closer to the photographer than five feet, and they're not going to shoot when the person is more than 20 feet away, they're probably using a wide angle lens. If they're smart, they're using a wide angle lens. Sorry, they're not going to get closer than two feet and no further than five feet. Then they may say, okay, I'm going to place my focus manually at five feet shoot at f22 this way i know from two feet to 20 feet which will probably be infinity as well everything will be in focus so i just put my camera up in the air that's why we use a wide angle lens and just aim it in the general direction of the person you want and take a picture and because of the hyperfocal distance or the zone focusing Everything's in focus. It's the exact same thing as we were talking about with the hyperfocal distance, but this term just seems a lot less threatening and intimidating than the hyperfocal distance. But it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same concept and exact same technology or technique. So now the photojournalist may well have to manual focus 
five feet. And as long as they don't get closer than two feet, no further than 20 feet, the subject will be in focus. So this is why if you ever watch I me, mean, I haven't seen it lately, but it used to happen a lot in the old days where you see there's a pile of photographers, hands up in the air, taking pictures, just blindly shooting, but yet you do see a good picture in the newspaper the following day. Now they may have to crop it and get it the way they want, but it's in focus. And this is how they do it. So picking a zone, five feet, it's your hyperfocal distance. And then you know from two feet to 20 feet, that's your zone. We call that zone focusing. Okay. So if this is my lens shooting at S22, two feet to infinity, it's almost five feet. Put it to manual focus and just shoot. This is an old photograph, but you can see the hands up in the air, they're all shooting. Not looking. Some people can get a good shot where they can actually look through the viewfinder. Others are just throwing the hand up in the air. It's not quite a Hail Mary, but they're, they're shooting knowing they have the subject in focus. And it is manual focusing. You can just guess how far the subject is. So this guy here is actually using a telephoto. You can guess how far the subject is that you're trying to photo, photograph. And then Put the manual focusing there, stop it down F8, F11 to give you some sort of depth of field. And you notice pretty much everybody has a flash just to give you some more light because you're losing light when you're shooting like that. If you're always shooting F22, you're losing a lot of light. Any question on that? So zone focusing is a term that is slowly coming back. So if you do come across and hear it, it's the same thing, have a focal distance. And all it means is choosing where to focus manually, knowing your minimum and maximum focusing area and ensure that's what you want in your subject and focus. All right, so conclusion, get to know your lenses, play with your focusing, become one with your equipment. And that is so important. The one thing that separates a pro from a serious amateur to an amateur is whether or not they understand their equipment. You don't want to set up your camera and hope for the best. Hope for the best is not photography. You want to shoot knowing this is what's going to happen. Now, if you're doing something for the first time, I'll just pick something out of a hat. So you're doing uh, astronomy for the first time. Okay, fine you hope for the best. But once you learn and you understand, then you know future what's going to happen. So when we're doing something more everyday photography, sports, wildlife, landscape, architecture, you should know what the camera is capable or not capable of doing, what your lenses will provide you. And I'll be honest, when I buy a new lens, or in my case, I, I, I have a lot of equipment, so I buy a lot of secondhand equipment, I go through like that test I did with uh, Rebecca where I photographed her in the park and I went from F2.8 to F22. I do that with all my equipment, all my lenses. I do it for two reasons. One, to learn what that lens is capable and not capable of doing, how much, how little depth of field it'll give me. Two, to make sure, because I bought a second hand, make sure all the aperture blades are moving to the correct position properly. If you start changing your apertures from 22 to 2.8, 2 and then you notice probably through the exposure changes, that means it's not moving correctly. So it's a good way to make sure there's no heat damage or other damage to your equipment. But it's just to understand what you are going to get from that image, from that lens. So you always know the results before you take the shot. And yeah, it does take time. Now, I studied, I mean, I did a little bit of photography when I was in high school. And then I loved it so much, I went to college. And I did two years in college. And I've been freelancing ever since. So that's back in 1990. So I've been doing this for a while. And I'm still learning. I'm still playing. And I'm still getting to know. I, I mean, I shoot Nikon, Canon. I have uh, Olympus. I have Pentax. I have a lot of different cameras because... The students have all variety of cameras. I don't have Fuji yet. I'm still getting a Fuji. But, you know, I have to learn them. I have to understand them. And it's not just the menu, but just the characteristics of 
each camera, each lens and what they can and cannot do. So go and have fun, have some fun, you know, get out and shoot. That, that's really the best thing to do. And I know we're all stuck indoors and it's not really the most exciting time to go shoot. But when you are down and, and blue, Give yourself a little assignment. It could be something right now. Some of the flowers come out. Go find yourself a flower in the neighborhood. Photograph it. Maybe do some macro. Maybe do some abstract work. Do something. Give yourself a little assignment to get you out and photograph. I did that years ago, but obviously before uh, the lockdown, where I would photograph abandoned barns. Just broken down abandoned barns. I had to drive up north and just find some barns and photograph. It was just fun. Um, I've only published a couple of those photographs, but you know what? It's just to get out and have fun. Okay. Okay. All right. So the question I have here is what you have presented also applicable to mirrorless fixed lens cameras. Um, okay. So that's kind of a double question there. So does it apply to mirrorless cameras? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, fixed mirrorless, that is what we call advanced compacts. Uh, it does still apply. The only difference is because of the way compact cameras are designed, they inherently have more depth of field than most DSLRs and other mirrorless interchangeable lenses cameras will provide. Now you have here fixed lens. So it's probably not gonna be that big of a difference, but with the compact camera that have like the super zooms and so on, they will give you a lot more depth of field than a traditional camera DSLR or mirrorless interchangeable lenses will provide. But the theory and concept all is the same. Yeah, it is. So with that camera, um, Ash, that your um, your like a cue there. Uh, play with it, play with that. The best way to figure it out. So photograph something up close, three feet away, two point eight. Now I don't know if that camera goes to f twenty two or not. It might only go to f eight if it's a uh, advanced compact. It might go to f eleven. So see what it does, and that's how you understand and learn what your camera is capable of doing. And most importantly. F2.8 is big, F22 is small. People always seem to get those things confused. Hey, Peter, I have another question. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing most of my photography on, in sports. So, as you can see with the, the zoom lens there, uh, one challenge is that I've been uh, kind of playing around with is indoor sports. So, we're talking about judos, uh, martial arts like that. Uh, we, so trying to put everything that you've been kind of sharing the past week uh, and the setting that I've done is I've always avoid too high of ISO because of the obviously the the, the, uh, the distortions yeah, yeah the noise uh, so I've been sticking well I have the uh, normally for judo I normally use uh, seven uh, sorry, 7200 f2.8. Okay, good learn. And what I've done then is uh, I've been kind of doing it manually in terms of uh, having it 2.8 to open up the lens. And then uh, at normally about 640 to 800 shutter speed, depending on which area, like which side of the, uh, or where, where the stadium I was at. And then I always stick to the ISO as specific uh, ISO, for example, uh, 600 or whatsoever. Now, if I try to put things together, especially what you're talking about today in terms of the sweet spot and stuff like that, if I now put the ISO at the auto, but at the put at the auto and then even setting up the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Shutter, no, not shutter speed. Uh, the aperture at the automatic would that help in terms of uh, one uh, the sharpness and also being able to freeze the the action, but then not getting the noise. Okay, um, that's a lot. That's a lot. And yeah, <laughs> you are in a very difficult situation. So you got a lot of things going against you, as opposed to going to your 
advantage. Now, the best thing you have going for you is your lens, 70 to 228. That's a great choice of lens. Um, you want as bright of a lens as you can possibly get, and that's a great lens to use. Now, how old are these people that you're photographing? So uh, at the Ontario tournament, normally it's range. It's from uh, kids to uh, masters. So you have to, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I understand what you're trying to get to. So the the action itself, it it ranges. They, well, the probably the you know the younger, like the teen to late thirties, will be faster when they throw and stuff like that. Yeah, because like you you said, um, you know. 600 it, no no not might not be fast oh, enough to freeze yeah. an action you might have to go up to 1000 per second to freeze uh yeah. how, how have you how have other than the noise how have your shot been sharpness wise have there been blur movement well uh not as bad so that's why i was saying that most of the time i i try to keep it to 800 but then the lowest i would get is 640 uh, i could still get a decent sharpness Okay. Uh, it's hard for me to get eight hundred, uh, a thousand, use a, a thousand because of uh, most of the places we go. No, Actually, not, so, sorry, not only that, they try to minimize the lighting as well because of it. Uh, what do you call it? It uh, uh, sometimes it, it blur. Like, you know, it it it's blocked the visions for the the fighters as well. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean. Um... Yeah, that, that's a that's a tough situation to be in. So ideally, I mean, you can't go, you're not going to go to 5.6 because, no. um, you just, I mean, that would be better depth of field to get both fighters in focus. But if you're just focusing on one primary um, person, um, F4 would be better. Um, and you might, might want to consider looking at software like Topaz, which has a phenomenal noise reduction um, program. Um, that might be the only real alternative. Um, what, what's camera kind of you shooting with, Nikon or Canon? And then uh, uh, ADD. Sorry? Canon oh, ADD. Canon ADD, okay. Um, okay, so the Canon does have a noise reduction feature. It's not the best, but it's... it's probably better than nothing um photoshop is terrible um the photoshop noise reduction does make the image softer topaz i played with it not the newest one but the older version and it actually is quite impressive i, I found it way better than photoshop so if you're going to be doing a lot and and perhaps even making a living doing martial arts photography it definitely worth the investment and then i mean see if they have a trial version see if you can do some shots and try it out with some of the photos and that way you can try to get up to 800 to a thousand at f4 because when you go to f4 from 2.8 you're going to bring that shutter speed down otherwise you got to increase the iso by one more stop so you're a bit of a, a rough spot so yeah. if you can see if topaz is doing enough for your images then you might be better off getting topaz going into 1000 f4 and your iso might be 1600 or 2000 and then let topaz do the magic for you but uh yeah you're, you're, you're really in a rock and a hard place i'm afraid i know it is a it is a, and also that's why it's a sort of like it's adjusting depending on where i am on in the stadium because uh there's some area that's nicely lit so it's i can get a nice kind of close-up photos, but then some other one that a lot of time I try to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is awkward. I know I used to I used to be in martial arts as well. And we used to compete at the CNE, and yeah, there were some spots that were brighter than others. Um, back then, it was better lit than I think to what they're doing now. But uh, yeah, it just, yeah, it's, it's difficult. You, yeah, you are in a rock and hard place in that one. Yeah, so okay. try it out. Let me know. Uh, my email is learn at schoolofphotography.ca. So try some stuff out. See what works. If you have any questions, feel free to email. That's for everybody. If you have uh, any questions, feel free to email me anytime. And, um, and if you have anything like that, if you have any specific scenario that you are having difficulty with, let me know. And I'll do the best I can to help you out. But, Thank you. Um, Definitely. Yeah, it's too bad right now. Yeah, it's unfortunate right now, you know, with COVID, everything, there's nothing happening. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, you may have to do a mock just to, you know, get some friends. Uh, if you have kids, get them somewhere and just practice. Let's pretend they're doing some martial arts move and they try shooting a different ISO, different settings, just to mimic what we're going through. I mean, obviously, you're not going to have the exact same lighting, but the idea is you want to see how Topaz works with high ISO yep. with the noise. And okay. that's the main thing you want to work with. So it doesn't really matter if you're doing the exact same thing, uh, but you just want to work on the noise. And and then when things open up again, hopefully somewhat soon, um, then you'll know, okay, this is going to work. No, this is not going to work. And I have to find another alternative. Um, Cause I know hundred percent, they will not allow flash. I guarantee yes. there's no yep. flash allowed. Yep. Um, so yeah, you really have no other option but to increase the ISO and then hope Topaz or whatever other program out there uh, will do a better job than Photoshop to reduce the noise. Uh, Nick was pretty good, um, but I found Topaz to be better than Nick. But I mean, try out different things. If you have Nick, then use it. If not, then uh, take a look at Topaz and see how that'll do. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's about a hundred bucks for the program. So it's not really cheap, but it's not outrageous. It's not like Photoshop thousand dollars used to be. So not too bad. Okay, thank you. Right. I uh, just so put the, on the, thank you. I just put a link that one of oh. the one that I did. I just okay. wish yeah, it could be less noise and a bit sharper. If we actually sharp is okay. Hoping to less noise than that. I definitely take a look at that. Definitely take a look at that. Yep. All right. So this is the question portion of the program. So perfect timing. Any other questions? And tech, if you want to look at the photograph now, I can look at the photograph now. It's up to you, or I can do it afterwards in private, whatever you want. Sure. You can share it. It's fine. It's on a chat. Everybody can have access to it anyway. Give me a second to load. Everybody can see my Safari screen. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I actually shoot with an ADD as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do some concert photography. So really low light stuff. Yeah. And the camera, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't do a great job of, of handling noise. No. Um, but I mean, I, I'll bring it up to 6,400 if I have to. Um, but coincidentally, Pete, Peter, we were actually just looking at the Topaz software on Wednesday. Okay. It's, uh, it's 79.99 US. Okay. I didn't look to see if there was a free um, trial or not. But, okay. Um, so how did you find the result on the Topaz? Was the uh, noise reduction good or just? Oh no! Uh, so I don't. I I didn't buy. I haven't bought it yet. Oh okay. I thought uh, uh, somebody was uh, demonstrating it at the Ajax the Photography Club. No, we were just talking about it. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, I I, I had um I got an email from them. This was like a year and a half ago, um and it, they wanted me to try. It. I mean that's, that was the whole idea. They wanted me to try it so that I would buy it, and uh, I was impressed. Now that was the older Topaz. The new one is supposed to be even better. And um, I didn't buy it, but because uh, I wasn't shooting a lot of high ISO at the time, so it wasn't a concern. But now I am doing a lot more low light wildlife, and uh, my birds of prey. Sometimes I'm shooting at um, 1600, 3200 ISO. So because um, I'm when I'm doing my freezing of the birds, I'm at 2000 with second shutter speed, and sometimes it's overcast, and yeah, the ISO has got to go up there, and the noise is brutal, mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean, it's obviously uh, shooting full frame is better, less noise than crop, but um, sometime even then you still have a lot of noise. Now this one here, there's a fair bit of noise, um, definitely. But um, freezing wise, good. I mean, the, the hair is pretty well frozen. The, the foot had a slight blur there, but I mean, no one really cares. Uh, and then here, the gi, there's some blur in the gi as well. Facial expressions are awesome. Too bad you don't have the flash. That would be nice to get this eye twinkle a bit. But um, no, that, that's good. I mean, that's good. And if you can, um, if you have Photoshop, there's a noise reduction, color noise and, and regular noise reduction. And it's going to just smooth everything out and the noise will be gone, but so will the sharpness. And then when you go to sharpen, it'll bring back the noise. So it's a bit of a battle. So when I played with the Topaz, um, 
there wasn't that battle. So it got rid of the noise and it maintained the sharpness. Now, did it get rid of all the noise? No. But, um, I mean, technically, I guess Photoshop got rid of more noise, but it did it by blurring it. And that's not the end goal. I don't want that. So I like the Topaz better because it got rid of more noise or enough noise, but maintained the sharpness, while the Photoshop, it, it really just softened the image. That's pretty good, though. Timing's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's the same challenge I have. I use the Aftershot, and that's a, yeah, the denoise is very, just very, very soft. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll go and I'll email everyone else. I'll go and um, I'll go back to Topaz website and I'll see if there's a trial version. If so, I'll email you guys the trial version just so you can try it out. For those of you who do um, shoot with high ISO, which, you know, it's going to happen from time to time. And, um, you know, if you're selling your photographs, then um, that's a very good investment because if it looks sharper with less noise or no noise, then people will be more inclined to buy when um, you have noise and it, it takes away from the photo. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the beast, but um, that's why we have programs to help with that. All right, any other questions? Well, if not, then I thank you all very much for attending. Some of you came to all five. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, so coming up, we do have the photo 101, photo 201, they're both on sale for just $100, six-week program, photo 301, four-week program for $75, and Photoshop, also six weeks, but it's $150. So um, some of you have already signed up for Photoshop. That's great. If not, uh, if some of you are interested in Photoshop and learning about layers, composites, and stuff like that, then this is definitely the program for you. Otherwise, thank you all very much. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much, Peter. Nice chatting with you again. Yeah, we'll nice chatting you. with you as well. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Alrighty. Thanks, folks. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.